The comments, opinions, and views shared during this program are of those individual Freemasons and do not reflect the official position of a Grand Lodge, Concordant Body, Appendant Body, Masonic Authority, or CraftsmanOnline.com. Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast, the only five-star rated Masonic podcast endorsed by the Grand Lodge of New York. Hey, welcome back. It's Right Worshipful Brother Michael Arce, and you've joined us for an episode on preparing for death as we get into the insides of the Haramic legend. Now, those that have gone through it, you know some of the themes of this degree are heavily featured, which are death, morality, there's a whole allegory of Hiram Abiff. We've invited back brother Dr. Jonathan Capel, who's going to lead us through this journey on some of the symbolism that exists in the ritual, but also as a medical professional, how he works with patients who are often confronting the inevitability of death while also trying to find some spiritual help and health for their own well-being. Welcome back, Brother Jonathan. Pleasure to be here. Back when you joined us previously, we did a really interesting episode with you where we examined um, death and we got into a, a really big talk on the belief in deity that a Freemason has to get into and that kind of stepped into this area and i'm also kind of confusing myself a little bit with backyard late night conversations that we may have had um on over the phone from my patio but the one thing i do know is that in the third degree of freemasonry the haramic legend is one of the the key parts of the degree we're not going to be giving any secrets away on this episode but the key lesson of morality especially through the lens of the experience of Hiram Abiff is what the candidate and the brother specifically is focused on. It also shares some similarities to other mystic traditions on death, and you've done some pretty extensive research on this topic, and that's why we're having you back on. What did you learn, for example, through Albert Mackey's work into the Cabric Mysteries? Looking at some of Albert Mackey's work on this topic with like regards to the Hermamic legend, it was kind of a reminder that the Hermamic legend is sort of uh, a modern repackaging of a lot of themes that you can see in other types of uh we could say almost myths you know the the cabric uh legend itself has a lot of similarities to what you know we talk about with the haramic legend and when you look at the cabric mysteries you can see a lot of similarities into other mystic schools that use a similar kind of uh idea about uh death and about the importance of it with regards to the way we direct our lives in fact there's a similar uh there's a similar kind of ritual that's used in ancient egypt that has a lot of similar undertones about the idea of transformation and seeing death as sort of this transformation of the person from the old way of thinking to something new. And you see a lot of that even within Christianity in the way that Paul talks as well. And so I think that this idea of transformation is a main focus of the Hermic legend because I think it's supposed to be about how we direct our lives than necessarily looking at death as this final end uh, to our existence, if that makes sense. We could spend some time, and I'd like to spend some time talking a little bit about that, the Haramic legend, because I think there's a few things that come up. Number one is that this is the final degree in the journey for a brother who started by knocking on a door, filling out a petition, asking if he could join, getting initiated into the first degree, the injured apprentice. A few months goes by, he's studying his proficiency. He's now passed to the degree of fellow craft. There's this whole other lesson that's coming to him. Now he's learning a little bit more about the building of King Solomon's temple. We get to the third degree and it's like, hey, um, you should have completed your, your spiritual symbolic temple in order to get to this place. And then you witness this part of the degree that has the tragedy, honestly, of Hiram. The story that, that is told is completely different in any other Masonic degree that you would experience, at least in the first two or the previous two. Um, you're, you're more engaged, I would say, in this degree than you would have been in the previous two, where you would have gotten a series of lectures or talks. And now you're walking away going, okay, so was this really the story of Freemasonry? Like the first Grandmaster of all Masons, they was this guy Hiram Abiff or like, what, what is going on here? <laughs> and all of the other unique experiences that take place that night that 
you're looking at investing a significant amount of time actually being at Lodge for your third degree. Do you remember some of the experiences going back to your Master Mason degree? There's a lot of things I do remember, but I think the one thing that kind of the camaraderie of that degree with everyone in there, especially in the Lodge I was in for like a year going up to the Master Mason degree, they all got to know me through the entire process. So for them, it was a big deal because they got to know me not only as a brother, but as a person. And it was their kind of way of giving back to me. For instance, in Texas, the way you do the degrees is you have to do your catechism in front of the entire lodge. So everyone sees all the work and practice you've done, not only in the lodge, but with your mentor and with that person teaching you along the way. The things that I liked in that degree specifically was some of the renditions in my lodge they did at the end, where it wasn't just at the major part that a lot of you know, brothers think about. It's more about the final lessons and teachings they talk about at the end of the degree that I think really kind of pull things together about what really is the overarching goal of what we're doing within what we're calling Freemasonry or the craft. And I think that's something I, that really resonates with me still. The entered apprentice degree is basically the child. It's you, you're entering into the fraternity, you're learning all about what Freemasonry is from the brothers of that lodge and throughout time who have put together these wonderful degrees. So you are the focus, like you're really focusing on yourself. So then you get to the fellow craft degree, where now we introduce a little bit more on that concept of what is a Freemason and who are Freemasons and how should you be conducting yourself and the obligations and the things that you learn about as far as the lessons, the, the circle starts to expand, so to speak. So we go from you to, as a child to now you as a man. And then the third degree is the final degree, at least in the three degrees from your Blue Lodge. And you are represented as kind of the old man, the, uh, <laughs> the sagey wise guy, right? And I think the lesson there is looking through that lens of life and that life, quote unquote, equals masonry. And that while your time on earth would be coming to an end, and we've gotten to this with the immortality of a soul conversation and also the belief of deities, you can see why you kind of have to have a, well, you can't kind of, you must have a belief in those two things to be able to get this concept is that Freemasonry is not just an idea or a fraternity or a group of men. It's, it's actually a way of life. I think that's a good way of summarizing. I, I would also add that I think a lot of what, you know, we, we think of like the three degrees as kind of like this linear progression, but I sometimes wonder if it's almost uh, a reminder of how we go through these different cycles in life, where it's not that you have these three distinct periods in your life, but you kind of go through, even within a year, you go through some of these transitions where you start on something new, uh, especially like, for instance, in me in, in, uh, in residency, each year you have different responsibilities and different opportunities and different things that you have to be able to do in different circumstances you're thrown at. And so you're constantly going through this evolution and change where you're going through starting off in one area and then learning the basics and then being able to help others. And I think there's sort of that kind of underlying, um, you know, themes that go through that, that kind of remind me that the journey is not this one time point, but it's something that you constantly practice even in short periods within your life. And I think it's a reminder that it's not about thinking that you have all the answers, but it's about being able to reflect on the different stages of life and knowing what's important and what's not important. Jonathan is a Texas Freemason who's made his way to the nation's capital. I am a New York Freemason who has made his way to this nation's capital. Um, and while we are members of the same fraternity, it was practiced differently, just like a religion or a faith would be. So I'm not sure if in the Texas ritual for the third degree, you get the same wonderful kind of speech from the senior deacon where he prepares you on um, what you're about to partake and who, the role that you're supposed to be playing. And the, the solemnness and the, the somberness of this and the significance of the morality and the life of Hiram Abiff and why he's respected through the lodge. But to me, when that moment happened, I was looking around and it, it's really the first time that you're going through something as a Freemason where you don't have that quote unquote faithful friend by your side to guide you. Now you're actually starting to make some of these decisions. So I like how you talked about that too, where the third degree, even before you begin the Hiramic legend, you are starting to be that man who's walking uprightly and 
now being accountable for the actions and the decisions that you make. I think it's also kind of a reminder, too, is that there's always something in life that will force you to feel like you're on your own, that you have these situations or uh, difficulties that you sometimes feel like there's no really one person you can turn to for help. And I think it's always kind of a reminder in the degree to realize that you have it within yourself to pull from. And I think that's actually one of the things that I find as an underlying theme is realizing that you're not alone and that there's someone there to help and that you do have the abilities and knowledge to go through the unknown. That's pretty much every day because there is never a moment I can say where you feel like you have it all figured out because there's always some variation or some complication or something where you have to be able to figure out how to solve even small problems versus larger ones. And that takes a lot of time to develop that confidence and those skills and even being able to know when you need to get help. What also makes the Hermic legend unique is that it features a cast of characters. Um, and they all have very integral parts to the story, but no one is more important than the one-time allies of Hiram Abiff who ultimately betray him and become the antagonists of our story in the Hermic legend. We refer to them as the three ruffians. So, Jonathan, how do the three ruffians represent the three stumbling blocks to death? In Freemasonry, we think of the three ruffians as like representing uh, like ignorance, prejudice, and greed. And one of the things that I thought about was the three things I had seen in my first year practicing was thinking about what are the things about death that I see people stumble the most? Mm -hmm. what, did, what did I see that cause a lot more of the pain and the struggle? And it always boiled down to fear. Fear of death was a big one. It was a denial of death's finality in the sense of people using, oddly enough, their own faith as a way of disregarding or minimizing death. And I think the last part was almost this type of uh, bargaining, you know, kind of representing this desire to replace whatever they have with something else that make them feel like they would persist on, even in the face of their mortality. And I thought that was something that really stood out to me because those are the three things I always saw that usually caused the most conflict between the medical staff and, for instance, a patient or even the patient's family is coming to terms with that. And I think those three things are important to kind of reconcile because I think we see a lot of that in even people, you know, we meet on a daily basis about what triggers them or why people make these decisions they do. And it kind of gives you a framework to be able to engage with the underlying problem that they're actually presenting to you. The Craftsman Online Podcast is now sponsored by BricksMasons.com, our favorite destination for all of our Masonic shopping needs. Whether it's apparel for yourself or a cool gift idea for another brother, make BricksMasons.com your online marketplace where tradition meets innovation. This is the coolest Masonic ring that I've seen for under $20. It's made from a mineral substance called luminous stone that took millions of years to form and can glow for up to six hours after being exposed to light for just 20 minutes. It's a stainless steel ring, a simple band with the world-famous Masonic logo across the circumference. You're going to dig this. It's available in two different colors and is the perfect gift for a Mason who wants to shine his light at all times. Visit BricksMasons.com and explore their extensive catalog Elevate your Masonic experience with style and substance. Plus, Craftsman Online podcast listeners use promo code CRAFTSMAN, that's C-R-A-F-T-S-M-E-N, at checkout to enjoy free shipping with your first order. Hello, Craftsman Online podcast listeners. This is Brother Jason Short from the Craftsman Online Reading Room. Save the date, Tuesday, October 30th, when our reading room opens at 7 p.m. Eastern as we welcome our special guest, Brother Mark Stavish, author of The Path of Freemasonry. We will be discussing Chapter 8, Occult Masonry of the 18th Century. Get the reading materials, the link to join our YouTube live event, and email your questions for the panel discussion at craftsmanonline.com. That's craftsmanonline.com. See you on October 30th. By the time this episode airs, my shoulder surgery, which I'm going to be referring to right now, will have already taken place. Yeah. But ironically, two years ago, when I was first diagnosed with a torn rotator cuff syndrome in my right shoulder, I went through those three stages that you're talking about. One was 
um, the fear of the unknown, like, okay, well, I've got this and I don't feel any of these issues that are happening right now. So I, I think I should be okay. Um, the denial of like, well, do I really have to get surgery? The doctor said that there's other, you know, homeopathic things that I could try. Like maybe an alternative would be stretching. So I did hot yoga classes for a while or, you know, resting it or putting ice on it or just, you know, sleeping a different way in my bed. And then, you know, finally was the, the bargaining part. Like, okay, what if I drastically change my lifestyle to try to avoid this thing that I need? And what ended up happening is that my condition just continued to progress and progress and progress to the point where it's now I'm like, okay, well, I still have a concern about getting surgery. The benefits of it are completely outweighing the upfront pain and recovery costs, so to speak, that would come with it. So th when you're talking about this, that's a shoulder surgery. I know that I'm going to be okay afterwards. The thought of dying or death to the average person who hasn't made it right with their creator, I could see why there would be not only that question of like, where am I going? What's going to happen to me? But how am I going to be able to take care of myself or who's going to take care of my soul or, or anything? Because I haven't really prepared my time on earth to even think about this yet. You know, there's like the people talk about like the five stages of grief. And that's like a common like model that's used for it. What's interesting is the person that made that actually didn't make it to be like you go through those stages of grief sequentially. When it comes to like end of life care or when it comes to a lot of these uh, situations about a person's mortality if they're very sick, what I see with bargaining, interestingly, is the topic of miracles becomes a way of people of actually using their faith as a way of almost deflecting the confrontation of death. In, in fact, that's, that's what I always thought was surprising was we talk about death as this part of life, especially within Freemasonry. But what I see is that when even people who have a very strong faith engage with the final acts of someone they love or themselves, there's this fear that actually comes out. And what I realize is that there's a difference between being told about death than actually engaging it within yourself. So in other words, People have actually had these discussions about death, but it's been very academic. It's not been dealt with from an existential perspective that you will die. Having that actually in your front of your mind that you have a finite end. And that's always a difficult conversation with people because the expectation, I think, from people they have is that they will die a peaceful death at their home with family. And unfortunately, what the truth is, is that it's the exact opposite people for whatever reason and you get two different dynamics there's two different ways this happens one is the patient's unwilling to confront their own mortality and so that actually i've seen cases where the patient's the one unwilling to accept their actual mortality and the family's trying to convince them to say hey it's actually better for you to go home like there's no other good options left for you to actually fight whatever you're having on the other hand the one i find is the most difficult is whenever the person's unable to make medical decisions and what you see is a lot of family members making decisions that, in their mind, is more soothing to themselves. But the question remains, is this really best for the patient? You'll be in this position as a doctor where you end up doing things where you're like, is this really the best thing for this patient? But at the end of the day, you know, that's some people have actually told their loved ones, hey, this is what I want. And you may not feel that's actually the best outcome. But unfortunately, some people have different perspectives on what they want. And I think I sometimes see people regret that because they look at, well, they did all these things and they missed out on not only good quality time, but they missed out on having a death that was not only meaningful, but less traumatic. Because sometimes the way you end things can be just as traumatic as the way you begin. And so I think about the ceramic legend, I think about that idea that the way that you finish matters just as much as how you begin. And it's kind of like the cognitive bias of what do people most remember? They remember the first things that happened, the last things that happened. Everything else in between, people can easily forget. But how you finish something can really resonate and stay with people longer than what you did in between those two. We have uh, jumped on a whale of a topic for this episode of the Craftsman Online Podcast. We're talking about preparing for death and examining the Hiramic legend. We brought back Brother Jonathan Capel, who's also giving his insight, not just as a Freemason, but also as a physician here in the nation's capital. We're using the example in the Hiramic legend because every Master Mason must go through this degree and sit through this experience to be raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason. And in this degree, and we're not giving anything away because 
the ritual is widely in publication and there's many books on this that are out there and videos on YouTube and whatnot. You do go through the role of, of experiencing death as a character or as a, as a part in the story. And it's up to you to kind of make sure that you have prepared for also the time that you're going to be spending with, with your creator or, or the essence of divinity. For brothers who may not pick up on all of the esoteric aspects of the degree, because just like everything else, there is a lot <laughs> that's in there. What are some key takeaways? If you could step back and we have a brother who's preparing to go in for his master mason degree without giving anything away, what advice would you have for him to prepare for that experience mentally? I think the more that you invest in knowing the people in your lodge, the better the experience you will have. So in other words, if you are regularly at the lodge, and I think uh, the lodges I've noticed in D.C. started doing this more where they will open the lodges on the EA degree so that a lot of the you know, inter-apprentices and fellow crafts can actually come in and engage in the lodge with different discussions or things like that. I think that adds to the experience, too, because they feel more a part of what's going on, and it becomes a, more of an opportunity for them to get to know everybody. I think that the more that you actually show up to the lodge, even outside the days of your degrees or other catechisms, whatever you're doing, it gives you the kind of security that this is something that you will enjoy and a good memory that you'll have not only within yourself, but with other people. Um, you know, I think that's, that's a big one. But I think ultimately, my main takeaway is to remember how far you've actually come. Because a lot of people don't even get to the Master Mason degree. There's some people that, you know, they start off with an EA, and for whatever reason, they don't continue, or they, you know, things happen in life, or there's impediments that come through with them actually being able to do it. For instance... In Texas, like a lot of people can get stumped by doing the ritual work because in Texas, it's mouth to ear. So you have to learn it not with any type of code book, but you actually have to learn it like through someone else. And when you're first doing it and you're taught, especially if you're academic, it's really difficult because you're like, I'm not used to having to just memorize things verbally. Oh, it's the world's oldest game of telephone that you guys play. <laughs> and it's hard because you'll see, you know, the, the guy I worked with was like in his 80s and he would just like know this mm -hmm. stuff. Like it was like he was a PhD and could just like, oh, yeah, I know exactly where to where this was said. And I'm trying to just figure out how to even begin and to remember certain phraseologies they would use. So I think that being said, I think just remembering how far you've come to that point. And realizing that you've made it through a lot of things that other people have, you know, not been able to, um, I, I guess, make it through, for lack of a better way of saying it. I would give the same advice that uh, my Masonic mentor and educator gave me, um, who I wouldn't say he was 80 because <laughs> um, he was probably in his 60s. Uh, maybe times have changed a little bit for him now, but his son, Matthew, is a frequent guest on our podcast, but uh, Right Worshipful Brother... Michael Brockbank told me that every question that I have ever asked will be answered in this degree. And I looked at it through the lens of Masonically speaking. So I looked at him, I'm like, you're telling me that all of these symbols, like all of this stuff, the Pythagorean theorem, the heart with the sword, like all of these things, everything I want to know about Freemasonry is going to be answered after this one degree. And he was like, yes. And I was like, no way. I am so going to call your bluff on this. And what I didn't realize was the simplicity of his question is everything you have always sought to question will be answered in this degree, which I would invite brothers or those with an interest in Freemasonry or uh, are newly even initiated or entered apprentices that might be listening to this episode to ask yourself, what was that question that I was seeking the answer to? that led me to want to join a Masonic Lodge. And it probably wasn't, what is the meaning of the symbol with the sword and the heart? <laughs> it was probably something bigger to the effect of, what is my purpose? How can I be a better person? And if that didn't get answered during your third degree experience, I think you need to go back and watch this degree again and then go in with that mindset instead of having all of your Masonic questions answered having your life question answered. When thinking about the big questions, I think actually in a weird way, sometimes I felt like I didn't actually know the exact question I was really looking to have answered when I was in there. I think it was more of during the degree, there were certain things that picked out and made me reflect more 
on uh, maybe some of the other questions I had been going through, experiences I had, and I felt like it gave context to some of the things I dealt with. In other words, it's sort of like you have all these experiences in your job or your life, and certain things stick out, and you can piece it together in your mind to kind of see something within your own experiences that are reflected within that kind of ceramic legend as a whole. Oh, yeah. For me, it was, well, I know there's something significant about this degree because they've made a real big deal about this. There's more brothers that are here attending this. We're meeting on a day of the week that is not our usual lodge day. We met on a Saturday, which we never did that. And we met early, not early, but at least 10 o'clock in the morning, we were in the Masonic Hall for this degree. And I'm like, well, that's never happened before. We usually do our degrees that night at lodge. Like, why are we... And then it's like, oh, yeah, and we're going to have a lunch um, after you, you know, do the first part of the degree, and then we'll go upstairs for the second part. And I'm like, oh, okay, so I'll probably get like another lecture or five. And But there's no more having to memorize things like, ooh, I'll be a master. They must have some like really nice ceremony where they roll out a red carpet and I get to come in and <laughs> pats on the back or handshakes or something. I, I didn't know. I, I had not gone or was able to attend meetings yet because they hadn't changed that in New York State. Um, so. I had no idea. And honestly, once the whole situation started, I was even more confused than I was. The f night that I first walked into a lodge as an entered apprentice and was like, I have never gone through anything like this in my life before. Um, and honestly, I would say being raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason, for sure, um, outside of witnessing the birth of my two children, uh, my wedding day, um, you know, the feeling of, you know, the day when I opened up the letter and said, congratulations, you've graduated from college, like all of those moments, it is in the top five most memorable. I will think and remember clearly the events of that day on my last day on this earth as I'm kind of cataloging everything before I say so long farewell, for sure. What I actually remember more is some of the things that surprised me was, uh, I don't want to give it away. We could talk about it later. I, I think it's also what is important at the end is you know the people that you meet on this journey i think that's also the thing too like within the hermetic legend like everyone plays a part but it's remembering that you know at each point in your life you play a separate part too and i think that was an important lesson that i kind of was learning especially this last year was that you don't have to always be the main person in your life to have something meaningful sometimes with different people you have to play different parts that they need at that point in time. And I think that's really important because then it doesn't become all about me, but becomes, well, how do I fit in with everybody else that I'm meeting with? What is it that I can actually do best to help someone? I'm Right Worshipful Michael Arce, and on behalf of the Grand Lodge of New York and our Grand Master, Most Worshipful Stephen Adam Rubin, I invite you to join us for a day of Masonic education, fellowship, and brotherhood at the first New York Masonic Con, coming up Saturday, January 18th, 2025. Our all-day event will take place at the Grand Lodge of New York building in the heart of Manhattan and feature Masonic speakers like Worshipful Brother Chuck Dunning, Worshipful Brother Bull Garlington, Right Worshipful Brother Michael Larocco, Brother Jim Laporto, and our keynote speaker, Major. Major General William Green Jr., Chief of Chaplains of the U.S. Army. Get ticket information at NewYorkMasonicCon.com or open your player and click on the link in the show notes for this episode. Kick off the new year with a focus on Freemasonry in the 21st century with the Grand Lodge of New York and the first ever New York Masonicon. about mentally preparing a candidate like what advice we would give them beforehand we know that before a candidate enters a masonic lodge traditionally they would spend some time in a chamber of reflection which in all intents and purposes is a quiet room that's kind of purchased uh, furnished with items that symbolize a masonic journey i have not sat in a chamber of reflection but i'm familiar with how they are designed Jonathan, can you expand on what items would be found in this room and what their significance would be? In Texas, they in my lives, they never did that, which I thought was kind of a kind of a bummer because I think there's a lot of important kind of symbolism in there and kind of that intimacy that I think is really interesting to have with each of the degrees itself. But going back to what you're saying about what's in the chamber of reflection, 
from my time over in New York, when I was able to see one, you know, you have a classic, um, it kind of varies a bit over time, but you usually have a skull. There's usually an hourglass. There's a mirror. There's usually a candle of some sort. Sometimes there is uh, an abbreviation uh, that has its own separate meaning. There's also sometimes alchemical symbols that are there represented. And sometimes there's like slight variations. Some people have a rooster. There's like sometimes a bread or there's water. And each of these things has their own little meaning. But I think there's certain ones that looking at for me really stands out is, you know, when you look at the skull, I think that's one of the more visceral depictions of death, right? Because there's a difference as, you know, in medical school, you go through your anatomy and physiology course. And part of that is actually working with human cadaver. For a doctor, that's like your first step of actually confronting death in still a dissociated way because you don't know these people at all. You you never interacted with them. You didn't see their journey and what they felt, all those, the emotional aspect. But you confront death. And that's still like, I remember the first day I actually saw you know, the person I was actually going to be learning from. And that I still remember to this day because it's this dramatic kind of experience. And I felt like in the Chamber of Reflection, you know, seeing the skull is sort of that same experience of reminding you about underneath who you are, we all have this similar basic structure about this is when we're dead, when everything is gone, this is what we'll look like. And it's kind of like that forcing you to confront that finality. Without giving away any of the, the secrets of the third degree, I think we've done a good job of that on this episode. I try to protect a lot of that, even as I mentioned, it's widely available. And then there's guys like me that they say, don't read this. And I went, went out and read it. We started this episode with a question on how this experience, the Haramic legend, prepares a man for his own life path. I know you've spoken about this professionally. Can you share any details from patients and near-death experience subjects who have spent their time kind of in this limbo place? There's a lot of experiences I've had, especially my time in like the ICU setting and even recently about the way people confront death from a family perspective or even from a patient perspective. I think ultimately what I've kind of learned from the reflections, especially with the Haramic legend, is thinking about the idea of looking at death as a reminder of the impermanence of life. In other words, realizing that there's a lot of things that we all go through that we try to continue on in this idea that things will be permanent. But the thing that we have to realize, and I like the Buddhist tradition because it emphasizes this, is that the impermanence is the permanence that we should hold on to and realizing that things will always change. But the fact that it is changed means that there's always a possibility and hope that things can be better even if there is something that ends up being harmful or if it's difficult or challenging. But I think even more deeply from what you were describing is like one of the patients I had when he was uh, really sick at the time, uh, he had mentioned specifically about the regrets he had. And one of the things that really stood out to me was he said, I, I regret not asking the big questions. And that really surprising because I never heard a patient say that before. But his willingness to say that gave me insight into what I think really drives at the fear that people have is that fear that they didn't have enough time to really live. They didn't really ask those big questions that I think that we all intrinsically have, but we try to cover up with being busy. I think that's the thing as a doctor I realize is that whenever I'm working at the hospital, it can get busy. Like You have a lot of things you have to do. Things can really escalate to where you have to make rapid decisions. Some people are really, you know, really sick. But at the end of the day, you have to have that outlet or that aspect of your Masonic career or even your personal life to where you can be authentic. And I think what death does, at least in my experience as a doctor, is that it gives you that framework to realize why being authentic is important. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that you can really judge in your life is, did I live the best, and we talked about this before, did I live the best that I could? with the situations that were dealt that I was given and did I live to the best of the ability of what was true to me within my heart and I think that's the main kind of two caveats I see with that but I also see this aspect of like you're mentioning about near death experiences it reminds me of one brother that I keep in touch with back in Texas where the reason why he got in the freemasonry oddly enough was his experience with a near death and, you know, his whole story that he told me was very interesting because of the fact that a lot of the ideas that he, or not even ideas, but the experiences he had during his near-death experience 
reminded him a lot of the ideas within the Hiramic legend. And the thing was, he interpreted it differently, but he talked about this ongoing journey he had of exploring other faiths and other ideas that he said just didn't really fit with what he had experienced. He's like, it was something so profound that it not only changed him, but he didn't know how to talk about it. And what was interesting is that he doesn't really talk about a lot to most people because there's this almost reflexive uh, action that people have to disregard it, Um, which is really surprising to think, oh, people would be interested. But in reality, a lot of people say, well, you were just really sick. Um, You know, what you experienced wasn't, quote, real, uh, which is for all you people out there, don't tell someone that with a near-death experience that's (laughs) actually been shown to cause, you know, a lot of trauma. Actually, no, in all seriousness, it really does. But what was interesting was that if you listen to what he had said, there's a lot of interesting correlations that he talks about with the Hiramic legend. And I think the idea of death and rebirth was one thing that he talked about because he said, you know, I'm not afraid about death anymore because I realized that after this life, there is going to be something and there's going to be something I'm going to experience. And we're here to not only experience, but we're here to learn to love and care for each other. And now it may sound simple, but when you've experienced that profound of something where your life has literally ended and you come back and like in his mind, he had completely changed as a person. When you listen to that story and you see how they can describe in vivid detail what they went through, it's very profound. Even as a doctor, you hear the way they describe it. I mean, it's not something that people with hallucinations or things like that don't talk like that. You know, when you see them at the hospital, they're not, they, they're not in the right frame of mind to begin with. But the fact that they can specifically talk about points in their experience coherently and almost as if they were reliving it is very profound. And so looking at death as not as the finality, but as a transformation, because ultimately that's what the Hiramic legend is talking about mostly is this idea of transformation. That's going to do things for this episode of the Craftsman Online Podcast. Again, I want to thank my guest this week, Dr. Brother Jonathan Capel. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure you follow us on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts to get new episodes in your inbox every Monday morning. And if you'd like to get them early and ad-free and also access to our bonus content with special guests, consider becoming a Patreon subscriber. It's a great way to support the show for just $5 a month, and you can learn more about that in the notes for this episode. This is Right Worshipful Brother Michael Arce. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. Thank you.